all right, that's that's what they want to fix by DOS Effects. If you don't know that song, I don't know what to do for you. I don't know what to tell you. We got the technology working. This is part three of our skeletal system tour. If you haven't watched the previous two videos, check them out. We did the thoracic cage in part two, and in part one, we did the axial skeleton. So now it's time for us to do the appendicular skeleton or the bones that are appended to our trunk, our limbs we're talking about, right? All right, so anyway, Brooklyn Biles is back. Uh, let's get this thing going with a quick disclaimer. Now, because there are so many landmarks and so many details and so many bones actually to the appendicular skeleton, this again is just a whirlwind tour and we will do most of the work of identifying the bones themselves and all their little landmarks and whatnot in the lab, all right? Otherwise, this video would be crazy long and we just have to get into it right now. So let's start with the appendicular skeleton. This is our map by the way, guiding us through this whole skeletal system tour. So let's keep it going. The appendicular skeleton is referring to limb bones and their girdles. And if we start out superiorly with the pectoral girdle, well, the pectoral girdle is composed of two bones, uh, mostly, and that is anteriorly the clavicles. Excellent, the S-shaped bone, easily palpated right here. I'm sure we're gonna have lots of body fun time, both here and in the lab and posteriorly in the back, the scapula or scapulae, plural. By the way, let's make a quick comment. A lot of words in anatomy, if they end in AE, are the plural forms of the verb, excuse me, of the noun that when it's singular ends in an A. So scapula, scapulae, things like that. All right, let's dive even deeper. The pectoral girdle attaches the upper limbs to the axial skeleton, yeah. It's the connection of basically, let's, let's translate that, arms to your body, arms to the trunk. Take a moment to appreciate this graphic, what's going on here, okay? I'm gonna take a moment, feel free to pause the video and, and take note of some of these key terms. And we're back, let's keep it going. It also provides muscle attachment sites, or your biceps and triceps and deltoids and ooh, the whole rest, right? We'll get into that later. The pectoral girdle allows for great mobility. There's a number of reasons for that, and we'll get into it in our lecture on joints, all right, and movement. But for now, just know that you have a great range of motion at your pectoral girdle. One of the reasons why, just one of many, is that your scapulae or your scapula is not attached to the axial skeleton. This, my friends, again, I feel like part of uh, being a student and having, having this information stick in your head is being amazed by it, allowing yourself to be amazed by it. I love this fact that your scapula, or your, uh, your, one of your bones in your back, right? It's kind of like your wings in the back, is not attached to anything posteriorly. It's not attached to your axial skeleton, I should say. There's a ton of muscles that wrap the scapula and hold it uh, flush against your back. But isn't that interesting? You've got the clavicle up front, attaching to the scapula and then the scapula just sort of passes to the back and is held there by many many muscles but it's not bone to bone attachment posteriorly fascinating stuff i love that and another reason why you have great mobility in your pectoral girdle in other words your arms right the reason you can swing around and do all those fun things that you do the reason why you can see the break dances get on the subway do crazy stuff swinging around by the poles is because your Glenohumeral joint, or where your humerus sits in the glenoid cavity of the scapula, all these words will become very familiar to you right here, is relatively shallow. Okay, it's not a deep articulation, which would restrict the movement in certain axes, right? It's relatively shallow. Okay, well, that also means it's kind of prone to popping out. So dislocated shoulders are far more common than a dislocated femur, for example. All right, so let's focus on the clavicle. I love the clavicle bone. Oh, look at that. Stopwatch is up, which means you should pause the video right now and appreciate what you see. Take note of some of the labels. Pause the video right now, and I'll be right back. And we're back. All right, let's keep it going. The clavicle anchors muscles. That's one of its functions. Second, braces and holds the scapulae and arms out laterally. Yeah. It sort of displaces your scapula and your humerus out laterally away from the midline of your body. It's kind of a, a functional scaffolding, if you will, together with the scapula. Okay, notice, 
uh, towards the midline or medially, you have the sternal end of the clavicle, and it's a very blunt end, okay? It'll be very obvious when we feel it in lab. This is posterior, this is anterior. Uh, and then there is the acromial end. Remember, acromial is that regional term to describe the top of your shoulder. So the acromial or lateral end of the scapula is going to articulate with the acromion of your scapula. So this you have fo facing out, facing out. This you have pointing out laterally, this aimed medially, and then you have to figure out anterior and posterior. I have a trick for that in lab as well. There's a little tubercle that should be pointing inferiorly. Okay, so we will um, play with this bone in the lab. It's going to be great. All right, so clavicle. And remember, both for lecture and lab, you have to identify whether this is a right or left clavicle. Get your practice in now. Could you identify this as being a right-sided clavicle? Okay, we'll go over it in lab, how you can, the best tricks to orient the bone in space and get that right. All right, so there goes the stopwatch. Now, here's our body fun time. We already talked about the two articulations, but let's use the question mark, pause the video, make sure you can answer this question, my friends. And for those of you that are already my students, you know what's up, right? Take some time, do a 10 second delay, 20 second delay. Can you answer what the two articulations of the clavicle are? I kind of already did it, but see if you're paying attention. And we're back. And the other thing that I want to do right now is have a little body fun time. You can absolutely palpate the clavicle. What's fun about the clavicle is you can palpate it or feel it basically along its entire length from the sternal medial end all the way out to the lateral acromial end. Cool, all right? Have some body fun time. Get in touch with yourself. Don't look too much into that. I'm just, don't, don't, don't give me your, uh, get your mind out of the gutter. You know what I mean by get in touch with yourself. All right. The scapula. Ooh, same thing. Pause the video. You know what the stopwatch means. Pause the video. Take some time to appreciate what you see in front of you. I'm serious. Pause it right now. I'll be back. And we're back. All right. Here we go. Take off all my ink. What are some things I want to say about the scapula right off the bat? Well, here we go. Stopwatch goes away. Hope you took some time to read these words. Acromion, coracoid process, glenoid cavity. These are some of those landmarks that we're going to have to know, okay, on the scapula. And this is just the, uh, the anterior aspect. We have to do the posterior side too. Okay, so here we have the acromion up here and the clavicle, the acromial end of the clavicle articulates with that. Check. We just saw that on the last slide. The coracoid process, the coracoid process of the scapula, remember this is the anterior aspect of the scapula, is an attachment site for the biceps muscle. It's the origin site for it. Ooh, what does that mean? We'll get to it when we do muscles. All right. The glenoid cavity is where the head of the humerus sits. I mentioned that last slide as well. Then a very shallow glenohumeral joint. Good words. Remember, it's a language class practice. I want to go back for a second. Uh, just to make sure that we understand that this is a right-handed, right-handed, this is a right scapula, and it's the anterior aspect, meaning looking through the thoracic cage at the anterior side of it. How do you know it's the anterior side? Notice that it's relatively smooth. This huge subscapular fossa is a pretty good giveaway, all right? No big ridge, no big spine. That's on the posterior side. You're going to palpate that in just a second with some body fun time. Let's flip it around. Now, pause the video, appreciate the fact that you are looking at the posterior aspect of the right scapula. What do you notice that's different? What are some of the, the, the structures that you identify and you recognize that are now flipped in mirror image style on this slide? Pause the video, be right back. And we're back, all right. Oh, my God, I get so excited. You're lucky I don't burst through the screen screaming at you. Okay. Ah, this new structure, which I alluded to in the last slide, the spine of the scapula. Ha, ah, dead giveaway that you're looking at the posterior aspect. And we do have fossae or fossa on this side, on this aspect of the scapula. Supraspinous fossa, a nice flat sort of shallow basin-like depression in a bone. That's what a fossa is. Let's not let the word scare us. Supra, that prefix means above spinous 
above the spine. <gasps> above the spine fossa. There it is. Very good. It's superior to the spine of the scapula. Well, if this is the supraspinous fossa, I wonder what this is. Pause the video. Bam, there you go. Infraspinous fossa. Infra means below the spine. Okay. And it's time for a body fun time. Get in touch with yourself. Not in the dirty way your mind in the gutter is thinking of, right? All right, I'll stop telling that joke for now. Don't want to get it too old. Body fun time. You can easily feel the spine of your scapula. You just reach back and run your fingers along. People love to have the muscles both superior and inferior to that spine massaged. We will identify those muscles in the future. Okay, so after we've built up, let me go back one second. After we've built our pectoral girdle of clavicle plus scapula, well, we might as well continue laterally and distally and build an arm. And this is where we really have to sort of put a lot of things on the shelf for a little bit, put them in our pocket, not for a long time though, but put them in our pocket next to, you know what candy, if you're my students, there's a candy in your pocket. And uh, we'll get to that later. It's an inside joke if you're the, not part of my class. Sorry about that. All right. So what I mean is, yeah, we can identify the humerus and the radius and the ulna, whose pictures should be popping up here in just a second. Uh, but we can't go over all the landmarks now because there's so many of them. Okay. So put them in your pocket. Don't put them too deep in your pocket. All right. And we're going to take them out when we get to the lab. But just know that the rest of the limb and when we get down to the carpals and their hand, oh my God, there's too much. So the next bones in the series are humerus, radius, ulna, and there's what the humerus looks like from various aspects, okay? Look at how many landmarks we are gonna have to know. Get ready, remember I told you this class gets harder and harder week after week. And then the radius and the ulna, it comes a pair. This is your antebrachial region, right? Or your forearm. You have two bones in your forearm, the radius and the ulna. All right, so here's an anterior aspect. Here's a posterior aspect. You get the idea. We will play with models in lab. You, uh, you will absolutely get to know these bones very well. Remember, level one knowledge is just being able to identify the bone on site. Boom, you see that knobby head. You see these condyles down here, right? And you say, oh, humerus. And then you see the wrench-like quality of this bad boy. And you see the hockey puck head of this bad boy. You're, oh, oh, ulna, radius. Okay, so that's level one knowledge. Levels two, levels three are going to be identifying all the landmarks and the functions of them. That's a little bit more complicated, okay? Just you wait. All those things I just said about names and uh, memorization and whatnot and being able to identify them in lab is true of the hands as well, okay? So as we continue distally, in the ulna here, in the radius here, there's an anterior view or the dorsal aspect of the right hand. And here's a posterior view, same thing, of a right hand, palm up, if you will. Notice that you have a whole collection, eight carpal bones. Yes, you will have to know the names of each of them. We'll come up with mnemonic, new, bleh, we'll come up with mnemonics and we'll get them. And then you have, so these are called the carpals. Then you'll have a series of five metacarpals, one, two, three, four, five, actually you start with the bone, with the thumb, and then you go this way, one through five. And then you have the phalanges, which are probably the easiest bones because you just have distal, middle, proximal, distal, middle, proximal, distal, you get the idea, right? The trick is the thumb only has a distal and a proximal. Okay. Trust me, just you wait, okay? We'll watch videos of people who have done it very well, mnemonics of how to name the carpal bones, and so on and so forth. All right, we continue with the appendicular skeleton. Let's go a little bit lower. Let's go inferiorly, and let's do the pelvic girdle, all right? Connecting the lower limbs to the trunk. We're doing good. Pelvis, all right, take a moment to appreciate what you're seeing in front of you. It's complicated, your coxal region, two bones. One over here, this whole collection, another one over here, joined at the pubic symphysis. All right, well, let's put some, let's put some summary information down here, okay? Because the, uh, the naming of all these features and uh, the bones that sort of fuse over time to form each side of the coxal 
bone. We'll get into it in the lab. So let's do some generic summary information here of the pelvis. The pelvis's function is to transmit weight and support the pelvic organs. Sure, it receives all the weight of your entire body above it, your entire trunk, transmits down the vertebral column through the, the lumbar vertebrae into the sacrum and then out, and then out, and then ultimately down into your femur. So that's the transmission of weight downward into the ground and so provides support for pelvic organs. What are some of those pelvic organs again? Hmm. What was the video? Do you remember what organs sit in your pelvic cavity? And we're back. Yeah, you should have said things like urinary bladder, uh, uterus, things like that. Let's keep going. Now, the pelvis is far less mobile than the uh, pectoral girdle. Okay, far less mobile than the glenohumeral joint, far less, but much more stable. Okay, much more stable. Uh, the strength of the joints here can handle far more weight, all right, and withstand a lot more pressure than up top. Okay, so each of, like I said, each of these hip bones laterally consist of bones that have fused over time, ilium, ischium, and pubis. Great, so you can check them off right here, the ilium up here. We'll see a colored graphic in just a second that will make more sense. And these don't fuse right away, so cool. It's another one of those instances of babies having more bones than you. And what is the articulation site of the femur into the coxal bone or the pelvic bones? Right there. Great word, acetabulum. Five syllables, good word, study it, acetabulum. Here it is from a lateral view. This is the right coxal bone, the right hip bone from a lateral view. And let's, let's identify some of these landmarks quickly. There's a lot here. And uh, in the lab, we'll get to the ones that you should study. Okay, so right off the bat, we're going to take a look at those three bones that fused over time and sort of come to a convergence point in the acetabulum. You see that? You see that convergence point right there? Okay, first, most superior, the ilium. Excellent. Then below the ilium, posteriorly and inferiorly a little bit, well, mostly inferiorly, but slightly posterior at points, is the ischium. Ooh, I love that word, the ischium. Trace it for you right there. And finally, the one that you can palpate a little bit through the front, your anterior aspect, the pubis bone. Okay, excellent. Let's see where this slide takes us next. Okay, some more key features. We were talking about the articulation site for the head and femur. The obturator foramen. What does that word foramen mean again? Take a second to answer that question. And we're back. Remember, there's a language class. That's the word we used to refer to a hole in a bone. Uh, trivia time. If I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, from uh, maybe in a Snapple cap. I'm kidding. I don't get my education from Snapple. But here we go. I'm pretty sure the obturator foramen is the largest foramen in the body. Ooh, biggest hole in a bone. Cool. Somebody look that up for me and check me. Ischial spine attachment site for some muscles. And then we flip the model over to get a medial view of the right hip bone. So a medial view now. If you can imagine in space, the other coxal bone would, would come out and, and form that girdle here with the sacrum. Ah, oh boy, it's a bad sketch. But anyway, just trying to imagine in space the other half of this hip bone coming into play. That's okay. Same layout goes, ilium, bleh, that's a tough word to spell, I-L-I-U-M, followed by the ischium and the pubis. Okay, good aspect. Ooh, it's body fun time. Let's get a hold of ourselves. Again, uh, joke intended, I guess. The iliac crest, part of the ilium, it's body fun time. This is the crest of your coxal bone that you rest your hands on. You can't see me doing it below my waist, but here I go. You rest your hands on your hips, and I dip, you dip, you dip. Remember that song? Anyway, you are resting your hands on your iliac crest. So have some body fun time. Palpate it right now. Cool. I'm doing it right now. Great. And so is this little character. Oh, my class usually flips out. A lot of times they don't get the movie and music references I make. But everybody sees this picture and somehow they know that this is the famous 
Cardi B. And everybody cracks up when this picture pops up in my lecture. Hope you got a good laugh out of it. But check it out. She's palpating her iliac crest. Boom. Keep going. A quick comment about the female pelvis. I really find this fascinating as well. The female true and false pelvis. Pelvis? Oh, boy. Interesting. All right. The false pelvis. Let's start there. Let's start with the false pelvis and read this slide right here. So we're actually going to start with the false. The female pelvis, the false pelvis, is superior to the pelvic rim. It's kind of like the upper rim of the basin or the bowl formed by the coxal bones. You see that? Nice and wide, broad, right? Excellent. So then what's the true pelvis? Well, the true pelvis is inferior to the pelvic rim and forms really the more realistic quote unquote opening that let's just say a baby would have to pass through on its journey out of the female body. Okay. So the, if you think of it as a funnel, well, then this is obviously the narrow uh, part of that funnel. And this is sort of the, the top mouth, the wide open spot, but really the limiting factor of this situation is how narrow is the opening inferior? How narrow is the opening towards the bottom? Okay. And that pelvic rim defines the pelvic end. I just said that. Let's keep going. If we look at it from an inferior aspect, look at, look at the inferior aspect. Yeah, this is sort of what it looks like. This is what that pelvic brim and pelvic outlet will look like. And here are the features that bind or that are that bound, if you will, the pelvic outlet. Pubic arch. We'll look at that more in a second. The ischia, plural for ischium, right? Sacrum and coccyx. Sacrum plus coccyx. Those are some things that kind of run interference in the pelvic inlet slash outlet. Look at that. See, they kind of jut into that space. Fascinating. All right. So speaking of the differences between not the differences, speaking of the female pelvis, let's compare it to the male one. I'm not going to go through this whole thing. I'll just do a couple quick highlights. This is a great table from our friends at Pearson. Thanks a lot. Check out the female pelvis here. And we're going to make some comparisons here. So pause the video. What are some of the defining characteristics or what differences do you expect to see between female coxal bones and male coxal bones? You know, what, what are some of the general things that we know about the he female hips versus the male hips, things like that? Oh, reveal the two certain. Okay, so pause the video and I'll get right back to you. Boom, we're going to keep going. We got to speed this up. All right, some quick highlights. Take a look at the angle of this pubic arch. On females, it's broad. Okay, it's going to be broad, 80 to 90 degrees more rounded. The angle in a male pelvic bone is much narrower, more acute. Okay, there's one difference. Again, what's the big deal? What's the difference? If Imagine if you're an archaeologist or if you are a forensic uh, scientist and, and whatnot. Well, then if you find bones and you assemble them, you can make a pretty educated guess, guess, You'd be fairly knowledgeable about the, uh, the sex of the individual that you found. This is really important archaeology. Look at the difference in, uh, in width, by the way, right? The female pelvis is uh, adapted for childbearing. So the pelvis defines the extent of the birth canal. It's broader, right? Shallower, has greater capacity. The bones are lighter and thinner and smoother. Oh, my God. So the males sit higher up in the body. They are not as... Uh, broad, they're narrower, and the bones tend to be heavier and thicker. Excellent. So I'll leave it up to you to read this table. It's a great summary. Study it. We're moving on. And it continues. We're here with a lateral view. Okay, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Do the same thing. Female versus male. Battle of the sexes. Blah, blah, blah. It's not really a battle. But notice that difference in space right here. I like to point this out. Between sacrum and coccyx, and the, uh, the issue, look at the, how, how, how there's more of an opening there, right? Crazy. Okay, let's keep going. The biological difference. All right, so much like our pectoral girdle and our arms, we have to do a bit of a quick tour with most of the work waiting for us in the lab. So when we move down the limb to the thigh and the knee. It really should be thigh first. Why does it say right knee and thigh? The thigh comes first if you're descending inferiorly. But anyway, appreciate this slide. Take a look at it. Yes, femur, 
patella. That's the level one knowledge, right? You knock that out. Levels two and three, as we go deeper and deeper, is knowing all the landmarks, knowing the functions of those landmarks, okay? So brace yourself for that stuff. It's all coming. And as we continue past the patella, patella would sit right here, we get to the two uh, leg bones. Remember, your leg anatomically is below the knee. Uh, above the knee or superior to the knee, superior to the patella, is your thigh, okay? Or femoral region. Femoral region, and then your leg is from your knee down to your foot. Okay, right tibia and fibula. When I was a kid, I used to think it was called tibia and fibia. Be honest. Didn't you think that too? Be honest. Didn't you think it was called a fibia? Well, it's the fibula, okay? We'll get into it in the lab. We will get into it. You can have a lot of body fun time with the tibia. I love the tibia. Just a little bit of trivia. Maybe I'll make this as a bonus question or a quiz or something like that. This is my favorite bone. Oh, I'll get into it in lab. We'll have fun with it. I love the tibia. I love it. Palpate it right now. I'm surprised I didn't have the body fun time. I'll put it in right now. Have some body fun time. Palpate your tibia right now. It's fun. Solid shin bone. Oof, I love it. Okay, keep going. All right, so like I said, there's a, there's a lot to know about these bones, and this is a great summary table. I can't do it all in one video. I apologize. Besides, this is lecture, and lab is meant to be where we do the exploration and the identification in person. So just take note of this table. Great summary. You have a tibia on the right, a tibia on the left, a fibula on the right, a fibula on the left. That's what that means, okay? You can read a little bit about them. Study the markings in the lab. Check it out. Yes, you will get to know the names of the seven tarsal bones. There were eight carpals, seven tarsals in each foot for a total of 14. We will do uh, mnemonics, okay? We will do all sorts of mnemonics. Don't worry about it. Then there's metatarsals, just like in your foot, and ju just like in your hand. And like in your hand, there are the phalanges. And they're the easiest. I love the phalanges and the metacarpals and the metatarsals because they're, they're easy to name, right? They don't, have, they don't have crazy Latin or Greek names for the most part. Some of them just go by numbers, one through five. Ditto with the foot. I just said that, right? Check out the arrangement of the seven tarsal bones. Yeesh, right? Craziness. We will name them all. We will name them all. This is a superior aspect of the right foot. Here's that medial view, same thing. And here's a lateral view. Yeah, we have to know the names of these bones in space, okay? We have to be able to identify them from any angle, okay? Wow, all right, so that does it. That is our whirlwind tour of the skeletal system. And for my students, this slide makes a lot of sense. This is the homeo work. This is how we keep track of where we're at in the class and what we're doing. You're welcome, right? So we just watched this three-part skeletal system series here. Okay, the three-part skeletal system series. Now you're going to move on to a lecture for joints and movement. All right, that's your next lecture so we can catch up. And what does this week have in store for you guys? Well, here's what we're doing in lab, right? We are going to identify all the uh, names and landmarks of the skull bones and the vertebral column this week. That's the focus in lab this week. See that? Ooh, you got a lecture exam on Wednesday. You got a lecture exam on Wednesday. 50 multiple choice, okay? And then we will have a lab quiz. It will be due on Friday, all right? So that does it. If you're in my class, you know what's up. That's how the, the lecture ends with a look at the homeo work. If you're not in my class, you know, the most important thing is you watched the video, you enjoyed yourself, and maybe you learned a little something. So... That's the end. I'll play a little bit of outro music as I get the technology powered down. Look forward to another video real soon. This has been the Brooklyn Biologist. Let's play me off. Done. Boom.